Hello everybody. Welcome again to the Mount Sinai MBC of Memphis Incorporated YouTube page. I am so happy that you chose to join us again. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come now to study your word, asking as always that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh. We love you and we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still, of course, on article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. Our author writes, We believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Now, our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And we've said that one such freedom that we have been discussing is the freedom from discouragement and frustration found in Romans the 8th chapter verses 18 through 30 and we have made our way down to verse 28 and it reads and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose and these verses caused us to slow down and take what I call the scenic route. We are taking a fresh look at the love the Father has for not just those who has accepted him, but the love he has for the whole world. If you've missed any of the lessons, uh, you can go back at any time and catch up at our YouTube page. Uh, which is Mount Sinai, MBC of Memphis, Incorporated. Last time we left off uh, at John, the third chapter, verses seven, which reads, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. And then verse eight, the wind blows where it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, at this point in the conversation, Nicodemus is probably in a state of total confusion, not knowing what to think or how to ask an intelligent question. And then to add to him being totally off of his game, Jesus knows his thoughts. And, and not only knows his thoughts, but he's answering his thoughts. That has to be mind-boggling. You've got to go back to, in your mind, to the biblical times in which this conversation takes place. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, highly educated, a teacher of the law, he is used to being the one who has the answers. He is used to being the one who feels superior. But in talking to Jesus, he has been reduced to asking unintelligent questions and probably scratching his head. He is asking Jesus how to be born again. And Jesus is answering his question. The disconnect is that he only understands in the physical realm and Jesus is speaking in the spiritual realm. Jesus has so plainly told Nicodemus in the simplest of terms, the principles of the new birth. Our natural birth is inherited from Adam and because of the fall, it's sinful. And because of, 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 of that, the whole world is born in a polluted, carnal, and an ungodly state. 
Therefore, there must be a new birth for grace to bring forth a new and spiritual life. Without this saving change, there can be no possibility of entering the kingdom of God. Jesus has explained this to Nicodemus and has given no exceptions. His statements was absolute. The spiritual rebirth and the new life offered through the grace of Jesus Christ is more than just a quick fix to an earthly sickness. It's a spiritual cure that allows us to experience and enjoy a spiritual eternity with Christ. But as plain as that statement is, to every truly born again child of God, to every person who is carnal, who is of the flesh, like this Pharisee with whom Jesus is speaking, will all have the same question. How can these things be? Those who have experienced new birth and are happy partakers of the unspeakable mercies of God have been taught by the Holy Spirit to expect such questions. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them. The things of the Spirit can only be understood by the Spirit. Therefore, spiritual things are foolish talking to unsaved folk. As believers, we do well to quit expecting unsaved folk to understand the principles of God that we are to live by. So Jesus speaks to Nicodemus's total amazement and says that he should not be surprised by what he's saying. In my mind, I can see Jesus saying, and, and y'all, this is me paraphrasing. I can hear Jesus saying, stay with me, Nick. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. The implication being, even if you go back into your mother's womb to be born again, you would still be flesh. In other words, Jesus is saying, get that out of your mind. Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Then it's kind of as if Jesus is saying, okay, let me give it to you another way. Once again, in my mind, I imagine that at that moment, a breeze was felt by both Jesus and Nicodemus. And Jesus said, the wind blows where it pleases. You hear it sounds, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So, so Jesus takes a, a natural occurrence like the wind blowing that's familiar to all of us. And he uses it to illustrate the sovereign work of God, the Holy Spirit. Think about it. No one knows the source of the air. We see its effect. We may feel it. We know that it can be powerful. But in reality, that is all we know of it. Now, I know we have weather people that like uh, for us to think that they have figured it all out. But they're only guessing. We all remember some years ago when a straight line wind came from what seems to be out of nowhere and did lots of damage. And, and there were major power outages that for some lasted over a week. And the weather folk were just as dumbfounded as everybody else. And of course, they spent a lot of time trying to explain it after the fact. The reality is, where the source of the air is concerned, the greatest meteorologist and the lowest observer are on level ground. The meteorologists may have more scientific equipment and, and more scientific words to talk about it, 
But when it's all said and done, it's an educated guess versus an uneducated guess. Neither group can explain how storms are generated or where winds are first raised and what keeps them up and what carries them on. Neither can explain where the storm retires when the blast is over and what becomes of it when it's all gone. Meteorologists have to wait until the storm has started to explain it. It started somewhere. They don't know its original source and they may see it dying down, but they don't know its final resting place. God asked Job in the 38th chapter, and this is the contemporary English version. God asked Job, he said, have you been to the places where I keep snow and hail until I use them to punish and comfort nations? From where does the lightning leap? Or the east wind blow? Who carves out a path for the thunderstorms? Who sends torrents of rain on empty deserts where no one lives? Rain that changes barren land to meadow greens with grass. Who is the father of the dew and of the rain? Who gives birth to the sleet and the frost that fall in winter? When streams and lakes freeze solid as rock. And so God asked all these questions to Job and many more. But like Job, we all put our hands over our mouths because that's God's business. And Jesus says, so it is with being born of the spirit. Jesus said that the wind blows wherever it pleases. It's it's a free agent. It, It doesn't have to check with us. It's under God's control. And so God, the Holy Spirit, displays the sovereignty of his almighty power. He comes when, where, and how it seems to his holy will and good to his holy will and pleasure. In the Bible, the wind is often symbolic of the Holy Spirit that gives life. In the uh, 37th chapter of Ezekiel, the hand of the Lord came and brought Ezekiel and set him down in the midst of the valley. And the Bible says that it was full of bones. Then the Lord had Ezekiel to walk around among the bones, observe them, take stock of them. Ezekiel's observation was that they were very many and that they were very dry. Now, y'all, in case that went over your head and you just didn't get it, he is walking around in a valley of dead folk bones that have been there so long that for, for them to just not be dry, but very dry. And so after observing the condition of the bones and making a conclusion about their status, God asked Ezekiel what seemed like a dumb question. He says, son of man, can these bones live? Now y'all with me. He, he in the midst of a valley of, of very dry bones. But now like Ezekiel, Uh, Now, Ezekiel, unlike Nicodemus, is in the spirit. And and so Ezekiel is speaking in the spirit. And he recognizes who God is and that nothing is impossible for him to do. So Ezekiel's answer is to the question is, oh, Lord God, you know. Then God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones, to preach to the bones, to preach to a valley of of dry bones. And and God, he not only tells them to preach to the valley of dry bones, but he wants the message to be specific. He, He says, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, to these bones, surely I will cause breath 
to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinew on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. That that leads me to believe that when, when these bones died, they didn't know that he was the Lord. But once he brings them back to life again, then they will know that he is the Lord. Once again, in case all of that just went over your head, in one ear and out the other, God has commanded Ezekiel to preach to a valley of what used to be dead bodies. They've been out there so long that they're no longer just dead bodies. They have been lying there so long and have been baked by the sun. And all the flesh had been eaten by buzzards or wild animals. It, 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 it had to have been a horrible place. And, and I would imagine that it was probably much like what some preachers and teachers are up against on Sunday morning. Just dry bones. Of course now, in this world of COVID-19, we get to hide behind our technology. And so we can't see you. But Ezekiel started preaching to those dry bones. In my mind, I see him preaching one of his best sermons, thinking, what have I got to lose? Then he, he, he is preaching out there in a valley of dead, very dry bones, just bones laying all over the place. Just, in my mind, I just see layers of bones just, just laying all over the place. And, 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 and as he's preaching, you got to remember that there's probably complete quietness. And, and then the Bible says, as he preaches, he hears a noise. And, and then he hears a rattling. In my mind, because he's in the spirit, instead of running, I, I can see him preaching a little louder. And, and I can see, I can even hear a hoop coming, starting to come. And, and then he looked around and bones came together, bone to bone. Can't you hear the noise and the rattling as, as hip bones start connecting to hip bones? or whatever they connect to, and, and arm bones start connecting to shoulder bones, and knee bones start connecting to leg bones, and leg bones start connecting to ankle bones. In my mind, by now, Ezekiel has gone into a second or a third hoop, and he, he's like, whoa, really into it. Then, as if that wasn't enough, he looked and saw that bones had connected to form the skeletons of many bodies. He, he remember he's in the spirit, y'all. So so he's not taking off running. He, he's still preaching. Then he he looked and the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them. Now instead of bones laying all over the place. There are actual bodies laying everywhere. Dead bodies. They have no breath in them. Now, y'all, right about now, I don't know which would be more scary. And, and of course, I realize this is me talking in the flesh. Uh, the valley of dry bones or the valley of dead bones. And, and, and of course, that's me in the flesh. But, and, but the spirit is not finished. God gives Ezekiel a part two of his sermon. He tells Ezekiel now to preach, not to the dead bodies that's laying around, but to the breath. The, the, the Hebrew word for breath is ruah, which literally means wind or spirit. The spirit of the Lord it is like breath or wind, because he cannot be seen or contained. 
He moves throughout the world in a fashion that, whatever fashion that he likes. I, I hope you're connecting this. I, ho- I, I, I hope you hadn't gone and, and, and got snacks or something. But you're connecting this. That, that between Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus and God's command to Ezekiel. God tells Ezekiel to preach to the breath. And, and of course, there's a play with words here between breath and wind, but all symbolizing the spirit of the Lord. And just like God told Ezekiel what to preach to the bones, he tells him what to preach to the breath. He says to the breath, he is to say, the Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Ezekiel did as God commanded and breath came into the, the, the bones into the skeleton, into the bodies, and they lived. And, and the Bible says, and stood up upon their feet, and it was an exceedingly great army. So, so get this. Now, instead of bodies laying all over the place, it's an exceeding great army that's alive that he is preaching. It is, it is God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. It is the spirit of God that moves on one that is dead spiritually and brings life. The word of God is living and powerful. It, is not, it not only has life, but it imparts life. It gives life. Jesus said in John 6 and 63, the word that I speak to you, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Nicodemus was symbolic of that army. He was life-like, but not alive. The life comes through the Holy Spirit. The preaching of the word accompanied by the coming of the heavenly breath. We can feel his presence, but we cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. We only know that it is of God. Well, loved ones, that's all I have for today. I pray that you have been breathed on by the spirit of God and that he will continue to breathe on you for the days, the weeks, the months, the years to come. But until next time, be blessed. And join us again next week as we continue with an encounter with Nicodemus and Jesus. Take care, be blessed, and see you next time. Goodbye.